Let's try that one more time. Has God been good to you this week? Was His mercy fresh and new this morning? Do you love Him this morning? Then stand, let's, let's worship Him together. I see the evidence of Your goodness all over my life. All over my life. Your promises in fulfillment all over my life, all over my life. All throughout my history, your faithfulness has walked beside me. The winter storms made way for spring. In every season from where I'm standing, I see the evidence of your goodness all over my life, all over my life. I see your promises in fulfillment all over this morning. Well 
Amen. You know, that third verse always gets me. I'm telling you what, out of all the hymns and all the verses that I love to sing, the third verse of that song gets me every single time. My sin, all oh, the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin, not in part, not just some of my sin, but the whole. All of my sin was nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Aren't you glad that you don't have to bear your sins because Jesus bore your sins on your behalf? Aren't you thankful that you're not guilty of your sins because Jesus bore our guilt and our shame and our suffering? He was our sacrifice. And it says, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, oh my soul. I tell you what, Christian, you ought to be willing to praise the Lord this morning because he took your sin, he took your place, he went to your cross so that what? So that you could be set free. So that you could be saved. Boy, if you're saved and free this morning, say amen. 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 Aren't you thankful that you're saved and free? Yes. Oh, and if you came in here bearing a burden, I want you to know something. You don't have to leave here with it. Because of Jesus, you don't have to leave here with the burdens that sometimes they, they seem to, to weigh us down and they want to get reattached. You just remind yourself of what Jesus did. You just preach the gospel to yourself a little bit. Self, Jesus took your sins. Jesus took your shame. Jesus took your problems. Jesus took your guilt. You don't have to walk around with it anymore. And then you say, bless the Lord, oh my soul. Oh my soul, bless the Lord. Let all that I am. Praise the Lord. I tell you what, I'm, I'm glad we got to worship this morning. We're going to sing some more here in a little bit, but you know what we're going to do now? Y'all know what we're going to do. Some of y'all said eat. Not yet. <laughs> Not yet now. We're going to pray. We're going to pray. You know, I tell you, if you've got the joy of the Lord in your heart, it ought to be an easy thing to come down and just bless the Lord in prayer. It, it, listen, this isn't supposed to be hard. This isn't supposed to be challenging. This is something that every Christian ought to want to do. You ought to want to spend time in the presence of the Lord. You ought to, ought to want to show up for worship. If we had service at 7 o'clock, would you come? Maybe. I love being here. I want to be here. Whenever we have the opportunity, I consider it an honor that we get to bless the Lord, worship the Lord, praise the Lord, and pray to the Lord together. That's what, we, that's what we do as a church. You know that's why we do this? You know that's why we show up every week? It's so that we can do this together. I can worship the Lord Monday through Saturday too. You can. And you ought to. But this is the time that we set aside every week where we do it together. And there, there's power in praising the Lord together. You know the Bible says He inhabits Inhabits, that means dwells in and fills up, inhabits the praises of his people. You know what? When we start singing about the Lord, when we start celebrating Jesus, he shows up. Did you know that? He shows up. The Spirit of God shows up in a place where he's being exalted and where he's wanted. Do you want the Lord to be here today? You want the Lord to be here today? Yes. You want God to change lives today? You want the Spirit of God to move in your life today? Who's up for that? Who's up for saying, Lord, why don't you go ahead and do a work right here in me? Amen. That's what we ought to want. I want him to do it in you, but I'm going to tell you, I want God to do a work in my life as well. And guess what? We need it. We need it. I need the Lord to work in my life. You do as well. I want you to join me down here at this altar. And I know some of you might not physically be able to bend down and just come on up front and say, I want to I wanna be with them even if I can't get down on my knees there at the altar. I want to be with God's people. I want to be near this altar. You just come on down. And Christian, you just tell the Lord, I'm so glad it is well with my soul. Tell him that. That's a wonderful way to start the prayer. Lord, I want to praise you because it is well with my soul. I want to praise you because it was my sin that you took. It was, it was my punishment that you bore. Those were my mistakes. Those were, those were my rash and wrong decisions. Those were my wicked thoughts. That, that was my stubbornness. That was my jealousy. That was my anger. That was my greed. That was my lust. That was my addiction. 
That was my hatred. That was my lying. That was my idolatry. That was my outburst. All my sin. Oh, Christian, how thankful we ought to be. Jesus, I'm mindful that you were dying for the sins of the world. But you are also dying for my sins. I take responsibility, Jesus, that I had a part in you having to go to the cross. You know, I've heard it said by others, and I believe this as well. If it was just you, if it was only you, just one, he still would have died. I believe that. And that's the way he looks at you. Though he can look at the multitudes and the millions, he can also look at the one. He did it for you. And just because of that, He's worthy. He's worthy of your worship. He's worthy of your, your praises. And He's worthy of your faithful prayers. He inhabits a place where He's praised. Jesus, can we just make much of you this morning? Jesus, can we just exalt you right now? What good would it do to exalt anyone else? No one else is worthy of this kind of attention. No one else is worthy of this kind of worship. Only you. Jesus, we recognize that it is well with us because of you today. We recognize that our forgiveness and our freedom and our salvation is a direct result of what you accomplished on our behalf. Our relationship with the Father was made possible by your sacrifice on the cross. We've been made whole because of you. We've been cleansed because of you. We've been given new and eternal life because of you. We've been restored because of you. We have hope because of you. We have a future because of you. We have joy because of you. And we have faith because of you. We can honestly say that anything worth having is because of you. Anything good, worth keeping and cherishing, you've given it to us. Lord, how we honor you. We honor you with our, our voices, when we sing and, and we honor you with our humility when we pray. We honor you by lifting our hands up in worship, but we, we honor you by bending our knees in surrender 
as well. You know what, Lord, I can honestly say, at least for me, that the easiest time to worship you and get it right is in this place. It almost seems natural to do these things here. But Lord, where we really need the help is throughout the rest of the week. You see, Lord, we want to make much of you tomorrow. I want to make much of you on my Mondays, just like I do on my Sundays. I want to make much of you in my home life, like I do in my church life. I want to make much of you in my conversations with my wife, just as I do in my preaching from your word. I want to make much of you in the way that I spend time with my children. I want to exalt you in my relationships with my sons and daughters, just like I exalt you here in this place. And I'm willing to admit that's where I need the help. Because Jesus, you are worthy of being exalted then just as much as you are worthy of being exalted now. And we need your help with this. Holy Spirit of God, we need your help. We recognize the importance of your leadership the other six days of the week just like we recognize the importance of your leadership when we're here worshiping together. I want my testimony to be better than a Sunday morning only. Jesus, that your name might be spoken from our lips early on Tuesday mornings. Jesus, that your goodness might be declared on Wednesdays at work. Jesus, that you would be exalted on Thursday afternoons. Jesus, that we would worship you on a Friday. Jesus, that our homes would be saturated with your presence on Saturdays too. That's what's needed. You see, Jesus, if we're going to do this right, we got to have your help. I can't do it. I get distracted. I get tired. I get impatient. But I want to worship you every day. And I know my brothers and sisters here this morning do as well. We're in agreement, Jesus. We want to worship you every day. From this altar to the balcony, we want to worship you. You've done so much for us, Lord. You've been so good to us. We declare here, right now, you're worthy. Oh, how wonderful you are. How amazing and incredible you are. How, how miraculous and majestic you are. How kind and gracious and sweet and loving and good you are. How patient you are. How merciful you are. And how willing you are to bear with your people, to walk with your people, 
to lead as the good shepherd those who hear your voice. How good you are to help us when we go our own way. How good you are to call us and draw us back to yourself. How good you are to restore us at the very moment of repentance. How good you are to fill us and empower us and lead us and use us. How good you are, Jesus. You're perfect. There's no better friend to be found. There's no better king to serve. There's no better master to surrender to. Jesus, you know, over the past couple of weeks and for the next several weeks, our, our attention is on getting the gospel out. The gospel's been in the church. Oh, we faithfully held to the gospel in the church, but, but we recognize that the gospel's got to get out of the church and into the world. The gospel's got to go. We have to carry it. Take it. Share it, declare it, proclaim it. You see, we want to worship you by getting the gospel out of here and giving it to others. What better act of adoration could we offer than to take this good news about you? And so Jesus, my prayer is this. Be exalted and honored in our telling others about you this week. Be honored in our speaking highly of you in our conversations with our friends and co-workers and neighbors and even strangers. Lord, that you might bless our lips with the privilege of speaking your name. The name above all other names. So that we might be living testimonies. So that we might be flames of fire burning brightly in this darkness. So that you might move through your people upon those around us so that others might know just how worthy you are just as we do that's what I want Lord I want to be joined by multitude in worshiping you Father, we want to take a moment and pray for the needs that are represented in this sanctuary. Lord, I don't want to miss a good opportunity to intercede. If you're here this morning and you say, I've got a need, I just want you to lift up your hand. Just right where you're at. Hold it up, please. I don't want to miss seeing anybody. I'm, I'm looking as best that I can. I see several hands. Hold them up, please all over the sanctuary I've got a need let's let's just intercede right now just keep that hand held up by faith now this is not a hard thing to do but it's significant it's significant Holy Father you know every need and we're praying especially for the ones that are represented by these lifted hands Father, I pray by faith, I just come alongside of those who held up a hand and I pray by faith on their behalf and in agreement with them concerning the need. You are able. Oh Lord, there's nothing you cannot do. There's no problem you can't solve, is there? There's no pit you can't pull us out of, not a one. 
We've never been in such great distress that you couldn't rescue us. You're an expert at rescue operations, Lord. There's no doubt about it. And so, Lord, where, where wisdom is needed, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would impart wisdom from on high. I'm not wavering here, God. I believe you for this. Lord, where it's a restoration of a relationship, God, I pray in the name of Jesus that you might make that relationship whole because you are whole and complete. Make this relationship whole and complete for your own great glory. Lord, where there is a physical ailment, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would display your power, greatness, and glory on the behalf of each need represented here. And I'm mindful, Lord, that some needs aren't just externally visible, Lord, but there's some physical healing that needs to occur in a person's mind concerning their thoughts and their attitudes. Lord, I pray for healing there. You're able to give someone a sound mind, God. A mind free of of these afflictions. You remove afflictions, Lord. You don't put them on people. You take them off, God. That's who you are. Jesus, we look to your example. That's why you came. To give us an example to follow, to believe in. And so it's easy to pray this by faith because we believe your word, Jesus. We're not wondering. We know this is who you are. And it's who you're always going to be. And so by faith, in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we declare your goodness in answering our prayers concerning our needs. You know, Christian, I just feel impressed to remind you it's okay to have a need. It's not okay to keep it to yourself. It's, it's okay to struggle, we all do, but it's not okay to refrain from seeking God concerning that struggle. We, we're going to get sick at times. Our, our, our bodies aren't, aren't perfect. But it, it's, it's not okay to be content. We honor the Lord with our faith when we seek Him for help and healing. It's okay to have struggles that just occur within those ears. But it's not okay to think that that's the way it's always got to be. That's not okay. Jesus didn't die for you to be trapped. I promise you know he didn't, Christian. Deep down you know this. He did not die for you to be stuck. He died so that you could be free. He died so that you could be helped. He died so that you could be delivered. That's why He died. I want to encourage you, let your faith be stirred this morning. Let God stir your faith. Remember the promises of his word. Hold tightly to them. Don't let the enemy rob you of believing God. And don't let others discourage you from believing God. You get close to the Father. If all you can grab is the hem of his garment, you just go ahead and reach on out and grab a hold of it. Just get your finger on the thread this morning. Cling to it. Father, I'm so thankful for this time of prayer. I'm so thankful that you work during these times. I'm thankful that you encourage and bless and work and hear and answer.
answer during these times. I'm thankful that you inhabit the praises of your people. I'm thankful that you fill up a sanctuary where there's faith, God. Thank you, Lord. Oh, I bless your name. I honor you, Jesus. We all honor you because where our faith is in you, we believe you, we trust you because we love you. Above all else, Jesus, know this, our hearts are yours. Before I want anything from you, I want you to know I've got something to give you. My love. We love you, Lord. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Woo, isn't God good? Oh my goodness, isn't the Lord good? Hey, give the Lord a hand. Praise God. Oh my. Folks, it's been so good this morning, I think we ought to sing again. What do you think? Amen. Anybody want to sing again? Say amen if you want to sing a little. Amen. amen. All right. Let's stand to our feet. We're going to worship the Lord. Mm.
God so loved the world. Bring all your failures, bring your addictions, come lay them down at the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting, God so loved the world. Amen. Oh, aren't you glad that you get to worship such a great and wonderful God this morning? I tell you what, it's good that God got you here. I just want you to know you wouldn't want to miss this. You glad you came this morning? Go ahead and raise up a hand. You glad you came? Raise up that Bible. There you go. I'm ready to preach, y'all. The Bible is God's Word. It has authority in our lives. The Bible changes me. I don't change the Bible. Amen. Let's read from the Word of God this morning in Acts chapter 8. This is such a good passage. I, I have been looking for, I can say, months, maybe even over a year, for an opportunity to preach this passage of Scripture. And I'm so glad that God finally gave it to me. I love this passage of Scripture. Starting in verse 26, this is what the Bible says. Just so you know, as we read, this is Philip the Apostle, okay? There's, there's Philip the deacon. This is Philip the Apostle. This is one that walked with Jesus, one called by Jesus, one who was with Jesus, okay? So now we're reading about one of the, the activities of one of the apostles. This is the Acts of the Apostles right here. Here's what happened. As for Philip, an angel of the Lord said to him, Go south down the desert road that runs from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out and he met the treasurer of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under the Candake, the queen of Ethiopia. The eunuch had gone to Jerusalem to worship. And he was now returning. Seated in his carriage, he was reading aloud from the book of the prophet Isaiah. The Holy Spirit said to Philip, go over and walk along beside the carriage. Philip ran over and heard the man reading from the prophet Isaiah. Philip asked, do you understand what you are reading? The man replied, how can I unless someone instructs me? And he urged Philip to come up into the carriage and sit with him. The passage of scripture he had been reading was this. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb is silent before the shearers, he did not open his mouth. He was humiliated and received no justice. Who can speak of his descendants for his life was taken from the earth? The eunuch asked Philip, tell me. Was the prophet talking about himself or someone else? So beginning with the same scripture, Philip told him the good news about Jesus. As they rode along, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, look, there's some water. Why can't I be baptized? You can, Philip answered, if you believe with all your heart. And the eunuch replied, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He ordered the carriage to stop. And they went down into the water and Philip baptized him. Amen? Amen. That's the word of God. You can be seated. For the past few weeks, we've been talking about the importance of recognizing our specific mission as followers of Christ. You see, you and I have a lot of purposes, and God's going to accomplish a lot of things, but the, the great accomplishment that God wants for your life is for you, as his son or daughter, to share the good news about his son. The greatest accomplishment that God seeks to use his people for is to get the good news to others. If, if I live a life of obedience except for an unwillingness to share the gospel, I have missed the greatest blessings in life. If, if I 
give myself to service towards the physical needs of others. If, if I give financially to help meet real tangible needs, if I spend my time studying the word and, and if I, I spend hours bending my knees in prayer, if, if I willingly raise my hands and worship the Lord in a sanctuary, but do not share the gospel with others, I am missing opportunity after opportunity that God intended for me to have. You see, the Lord knows just how good the good news is. He knows it. And so something so wonderful can't be kept secret or to ourselves. And so God says, I know how good this is. And I know how much it's changed your life. Surely you can share it with a few others. Surely you can tell some other people about what I've done for you and what I will do for them. You see, we are the messengers of the gospel. We're, we're the bearers, the bringers of good news. We, we have not been called to preach damnation and judgment alone. We have been called to declare that sin has its consequences and they are eternal, that judgment is sure, but that there's grace, that there's salvation. That forgiveness is available. That a, that a new life can come. That an eternal hope can be held on to. You, you and I have to be preaching that message. Who else will preach it if we don't? People that do, know, do not know God can't share the gospel. They have no incentive to share the gospel. People that are far from God do not share the gospel. People that don't believe in God do not share the gospel. People who have other solutions for their problems, other paths for their salvations, do not share the gospel. We do. It's ours to share. It's our good news. It's the best news I've ever heard. You heard anything better than total forgiveness of everything you've ever done? Past, present, and future? You heard better news than that? H have you heard better news than being adopted into the royal family of God? You heard better news than that? Have you heard better news than having a father in heaven who not only gracefully looks over his children on earth but also awaits their arrival into his home? Have you heard better news than that? There is none. You and I are supposed to be carrying this gospel. It's, it's not something that we, that we put down right before we leave. It's something that we have all the time. The gospel is not external to you, Christian. It's not something you've got to pick up. It's something that you already possess. You have the gospel. And all you're supposed to do is share it. You see, the enemy wants to complicate this. The enemy wants to, to convolute the simplicity of the gospel. The, the enemy wants to make it appear challenging and, and maybe only for the professionals. The, the enemy wants, wants to use every strategic opportunity he has to discourage you from sharing the gospel. Why? Because even the enemy knows that the gospel changes lives. Even the enemy knows this. So there's a, a constant all-out demonic effort against God's people so that they will not share the gospel. Satan attacks the hardest over the gospel. We need to remember that. I love inviting people to our church. I do it all the time. 
I know some of you do as well. I, I, I really believe that this is a great place for a believer to come if they don't have a church so that they might worship, so that they might just experience the goodness of God and, and so that they might be around other believers, building one another up in their faith. I, I also love to invite people that may not know God to come here because I believe this is a great place for someone who's lost to be found. <laughs> I believe this is a place where somebody walks in guilty and they can, they can leave declared innocent. I believe that. But I'll say this. Even for me, it's easier to invite them to church than to share the gospel. It's easier. Why is that? Well, not only am I confident in it, not only do I believe it's true, just as I'm confident in the gospel and I believe the, the gospel is true, but there's not as much demonic resistance to inviting someone to church as there is to declaring the gospel in that moment. There is real resistance from the enemy to try and suppress our sharing the gospel. We have to recognize that. You know, you kind of have to know your enemy a little bit. You kind of you have to be aware of some of his strategies, some of his tactics. That way what? You can have victory. That way you can move forward. That way you can have success. That way you won't be deterred. Christian, you and I, when we leave here today, are supposed to go with the gospel so that we can share the gospel. Every Christian in this sanctuary is a spiritual representation of the power of the gospel. Every single Christian here is living evidence of the transformational effect that the gospel has when it is given and received. There's a world full of people who need to be given the gospel so that they can receive the gospel. Every week I've asked someone to share their testimony for a few minutes so that we can be reminded of just what the gospel does and how wonderfully it comes along to a person and challenges them and confronts them and convicts them, but also offers salvation to them. So a couple of weeks ago I shared, and then last week Pastor Chris shared, and, and I've asked Pastor Mike if he would share this morning. So Mike, you come on up, and I want to make sure that we've got this uh, pulpit mic on. Come on up, brother. Give Mike a hand. Aren't, don't you appreciate Brother Mike, thank you. Well, good morning. Uh, most time I'm not here for the early service. Somebody told me there was a breakfast buffet. Yeah, that's what he keeps telling me. That's right, Pastor. Amen. Uh, but uh, just uh, two things before I get started today. Uh, in my testimony, I'm not glorifying, I am not glorifying sin uh, in sharing a little bit of my testimony, and I'm not seeking doing it for sympathy. Does that make sense? You got those two things? Okay. My favorite verse is Romans 5 8, but God demonstrated or commendeth his love toward us while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now, that's my favorite verse because that is the verse the Holy Spirit used to penetrate the darkness of my mind and my heart and bring me into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Um, my first childhood memory uh, is my older sister Dolores holding her hands over my ears as we looked through a floor vent looking into the basement of the home that we lived in then and my brother, older brother, of course has already been beaten by my dad and my mom is laying on the basement floor and my dad is stomping my mother. 
That's my first childhood memory and my sister's covering my ears to muffle the screams and the blows. So my testimony is a little different than, than most people's. Uh, and yes, that has an effect on you, but I'm thankful that darkness is not what defines me. And by the grace of God, it's not the end of the story. Hallelujah. They were two guys, and I'm trying to be mindful of time. Five minutes is not much for me. Uh, okay. But uh, two guys were actually, and I, I'm doing the concise version. Everybody say amen right there, okay? All right. This is kind of the breakfast burrito type deal. It's all mushed together. But they were two guys out on visitation. I wasn't brought up in church. My mom was a Christian. My dad was not. It was a divided home. You had darkness. You had light. Okay. Mom tried to bring light into the home. Dad would resist that, of course. But they were two guys out on visitation from Mount Pleasant Baptist Church. I grew up in that area up in there. And they actually, just how the Lord works, they stopped by my mom and dad's home. I'm still, you know, uh, still uh, living at home at this time. And they stopped by my mom and dad's house to ask directions to another person's home they were going to visit. And instead of just asking directions and leaving, guess what they done? They shared the gospel. They shared the Romans Road. Of course, I didn't know the Romans Road. I couldn't tell you the four gospels, the books. I couldn't tell you that. Um, but, of course, Mom had prayed uh, for me over the years. I would hear her in the other room. Anyway, I'm concise in it, David. Okay. Um, I need to write a book. No, I'm just kidding. Uh that wouldn't be any good, but uh, but uh, they started sharing the gospel with me. And those guys, they just kept coming back. They would come to the front door. I would run out the side door of the house. Anybody else ever do that? People come in the front to share the gospel? Dale, I know you did. Yes, I know. Cause, amen. Uh, but thank God, I, I say that jokingly, but thank God they kept coming. Because I didn't want to hear it, but I did. Does that make sense? Uh, because I got sick of the life of sin. The life of sin, the darkness. I had friends that were in prison. I had friends that had died in car wrecks. I had friends uh, that were paralyzed from the neck down in car wrecks. And, and all kinds of different stuff. Got to do concise. All kinds of different stuff. Uh, but they kept coming and they kept sharing the gospel. And then December 15th, 1991, at Cricket Baptist Church, uh, and that's an amazing story too, okay? I'm going to take about seven minutes, okay? My mom had really been working on me, you know, to come to church, okay? And uh, I'm a defiant, rebellious son. I've apologized to her for that multiple times over the years. But they're having this Christmas play at Cricket Baptist Church. I dreamed I searched heaven for you. Mom invites me to church. Um, I cuss her out for inviting me to church. I want no part of it. I want no part of your Jesus, your God. You leave me alone, you know. Well, Lord wouldn't have it that way. So I completely rejected Mom's invitation to go to church. So I'm out riding around in my little sports car. And before I realize it, and now this is standing room only service at the church. I say that to, to tell you how God's working this out. Okay, Cricket Baptist Church, probably most of you know where it's at, but okay, standing room only church service. I'm out riding around in my car, have no intention of going to mom and dad's church. You follow me? No intention whatsoever. Before I realize what I'm doing, I park my car and I'm halfway to the front door of the church. And I said to myself in my mind, I said, I'll get my mom off my back. I will just uh, go in to the service just to get her off my back. The Lord had different plans, though. Amen. Long story short, uh, go into the church. Again, it's as far as the service capacity, what is it? Standing room only. I mean, it literally is standing room only. But guess what? Three pews from the back walking in on the left-hand side. There's my mom and dad, and guess what's available right beside of them? A seat. Amen? So, all right, the, the Christmas play, I Dreamed a Search Heaven for You, is you have people that come before God in judgment, 
You have people that are saved, have trusted Christ as Lord and personal Savior. They're robed in white and ushered into the portals of glory, okay? And then you have those people like myself at that time, lost and undone. And God says to them, depart from me. I never knew you workers of iniquity. Well, then the devil comes and his demonic forces come from the back of the church and they grab you kicking and screaming and drag you off into hell. Well, the Holy Spirit worked in my mind and my heart, and they weren't dragging that character to hell. That was me they were dragging to hell. And, and you've heard preachers pray sometimes. I, would, I, I pray I would preach hell so hot they could smell the smoke and feel the heat. Nobody ever heard that but me. I know. Well, I'm glad I did. Amen? So the devil and his demons were dragging me to hell, but then I saw Jesus, him loving me, him laying down his life on the cross for me. Because that's what I couldn't wrap my mind around. The young man from Mount Pleasant, and I'm way over time, the young man from Mount Pleasant told me, you know, God demonstrated his love. And I'm like, you've told me God knows everything I've ever thought, everything I've ever done. How in the world could he love me? You know? How could he love me? But he does. It's unconditional. It's everlasting. It's eternal. And he loved me so much, he willingly gave his life on the cross. So that night, when the time of invitation came, my fingerprints are still in the back of the pew there at Cricket. The Holy Spirit was dealing with me, convicting me. And I'm doing a concise version. But that night, I, I remember taking that first step starting to take that first step. Next thing I remember, I was on the altar and Dean Crane, I didn't understand what he was sharing with me at that time. Well, yeah, the people from Mount Pleasant, he was sharing the Romans road with me. There's none righteous, no, not one. All of sin comes short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. You know what my prayer was? Lord, I don't want to die and go to hell. I believe Jesus loved me. He died on the cross for me and I ask you to save me. That was it. And guess what? I found peace when the Prince of Peace passed by my way. I looked for peace in all the wrong places and all the wrong things, but I found peace that night. And I thank the Lord for it. Amen. I tried to be short, David. When you're dealing with preachers, you tell them five minutes because you know it'll be longer. And that's all right. Listen. I want you to know something. Everybody here needed to hear that. And that wasn't the first time I heard your testimony. But I love hearing people's testimony. It reminds me, it, it encourages me, right? It, 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 it invigorates me to hear someone vividly recount how they met Jesus. And I love how the Lord works in each and every person's salvation. It's just this unique story. Right? It's the same good news every time. It's the same good news. But how it gets to them and how they respond to it in terms of what they're going through and, and where they've been, right? Every single time, that, that person has their own story to tell. And I'm glad you told it, brother, and you ought to keep telling it. Because, listen, you've got a powerful testimony. You've got a powerful testimony. I have a powerful testimony. You want to know why? Because every person's testimony is powerful. Every person's testimony is powerful. Why? Because God's in it. And if God's in it, power's in it. When, when lives are changed, whether it was at VBS when you were a kid, whether it was at Revival, whether it was on a Sunday morning, whether, whether it was at a, a, a church play, whether it was at your grandma's kitchen table, wherever it is, it's a powerful testimony because that's when you met God the Lord. That's when you were born again. Now the passage of scripture that we read at the beginning of the message, that is the Ethiopian treasurer's testimony. After that day, he went back to Ethiopia, back to the court of the queen, and he had a story to tell. He had a testimony to share. He had good news that he had heard and received, responded to, that he could then pass out to others as well. I'm mindful that there's some really neat things to learn.
to, to, to get equipped concerning how God used Philip to save the Ethiopian eunuch. So here's four words that we're going to use to kind of just help be a, a, a reminder. These are I, I intentionally wanted this to be simple because simple is a little easier to remember sometimes. So they're just four words. And believe it or not, in, in good preacher fashion, they all even start with the same letter. I don't do a lot of that, but sometimes I do. They all start with the same letter. And the first is this. If you're going to share the gospel, number one, you've got to listen to the Lord. The Lord knows who needs the gospel. The Lord knows where seeds have already been planted. The Lord knows where fertile ground lies. The, the Lord knows who's ripe for the harvest. You see, the Lord is always working. That, that's the thing we forget. He doesn't just start working when we show up. He's always working. He, he's using many, many more people to reach someone than you might think. He, he's literally right now using the prayers of people who worshiped before us in Europe to do a work in America today. He's using the prayers of people on the East Coast to plant seeds in the lives of people on the West Coast. He, he's using someone else's co-workers, someone else's neighbor, someone else's friend to reach the person that you're going to cross paths with so that you might reap the harvest. That's, that's how amazing and intricate God works. So you need to listen to him. He knows where everybody's at. He knows where everybody's going. Philip was listening. The Lord first spoke to him in verse 26. Through an angel he said, As for Philip, an angel of the Lord said to him, So in other words, Philip had to be willing to listen to this angelic instruction, go south down the desert road that runs from Jerusalem to Gaza. Specific instructions that God gives. Was Philip listening? Yes. He listened. Philip was listening to the Lord. He was attentive to the Lord's instructions. And so rather than do his thing, what he wanted, where he wanted... He said, I have been told by God that this is what I need to do, and so I'm going to do it. And so he goes in that very direction, down that very road. And then in verse 29, he's given another specific instruction that I'm glad he was listening to. The Holy Spirit said to Philip, go over and walk along beside the carriage. The Ethiopian eunuch doesn't get saved if Philip isn't listening. The, the, the treasurer of the nation of Ethiopia doesn't get born again if Philip doesn't take a walk. If Philip isn't willing to, to change his schedule, to head in a direction maybe he had not previously planned to head in. And Christian, I want us to be mindful of this. Listen. Be aware that God might have a different appointment for you to make than the one you think you're supposed to make. Be, be aware that God might have a different path for you to walk down than the one you had planned to walk down. Be, be aware that God can speak in the little things and in the little ways and give little instructions that make a big difference. I want you to walk down this road in this direction. That seems unimportant. But when you read the rest of the story, it made a big difference, didn't it? You see, be mindful that the Lord might just whisper. But that whisper might end up with someone's life being changed. Be, be mindful that God doesn't have to shout every instruction. Let, let the leadership of the Holy Spirit in your life be enough. Let those promptings, let, let those little nudges have effect in your life. Listen to the Lord. The second is this. Look for an open door. 
If you're going to be ready to share the gospel, you have to listen, but you also have to be looking. Philip was looking for an open door. This is what the Bible says in verse 30 and 31. Philip ran over and heard the man reading from the prophet Isaiah. And here's the open door. You ready? He heard him reading from the prophet Isaiah. He saw that there was potential there. He saw that there was some fertile ground because someone else was already reading the word. Seeds had already been planted. And so Philip asked, do you understand what you're reading? That was the open door. Philip walked through it. Look at what it says in verse 31. The man replied, how can I unless someone instructs me? And he urged Philip to come up into the carriage and sit with him. You see, Christian, you've got to be looking for these open doors. I want to give you a couple of examples. Here's an open door. You go to work tomorrow. You ask someone what we always ask others when we see them. How are you? How you doing? Now, most of the time, they're going to give you the sterile answer. Fine, great, okay, whatever. But every now and then, guess what happens? The door opens. And they say something like this. Man, I've been having a hard time. Open door. Right there, open door. Or they'll say something like, things just haven't been going well. Open door. You see... If you're, if you're looking, there's doors opening up all the time when you're around other people. Maybe if this is a close friend, oh, this is so good. Let's say you haven't talked to them in a while. This is somebody you go way back with. So, somebody that when you, when you talk, it's just like you, you left off where you were at the last time. You, you've got friends like that. I have friends like that. I might not talk to them for three months, but then if we talk, it's like we just got through talking 10 minutes before, right? So first time in three months, first time in six months, first time in three years. You call them. Call them sometime this week. Hey, I was thinking about you. I just want to check in see how you were doing. Their response might be that open door. Philip just asked a question. Do you, do you understand what, what you're reading? I mean, I, I, I know you're reading it, but I'm just wondering, do you, do you understand what you're reading there? And the guy said, how can I? It's, I mean, they're just words to me. I, I want to understand, but, but I, I, I don't. Somebody's got to explain this to me, right? Philip said, I'm your huckleberry, <laughs> right? I can, I can help you with that. He just climbed right on up into that carriage and said, let, let me help you out with this, right? Listen, Christian, there's going to be open doors. Listen to the Lord because the Lord knows where the doors are. The, he knows. He knows where the walls are, where he's not going to waste your time. Maybe there'll be a door there later, but not right now, right? He knows this. He knows where the opportunities are at. And so he's going to instruct you in that direction. But then you've got to be looking for those doors. Be obedient, but also be aware. Be looking. There, there are people that you will talk to this week. A door will swing wide open if you ask the right question. The door will swing open. If you show concern for them, now don't ask the question if you're not willing to invest the time. Don't ask the question and give somebody an opportunity to open that door for you, and then you just go on. Because what they've done is, is they've given you insight into their life. They've been vulnerable and honest in that moment with you. And then don't say, well, I'll pray for you. Listen, if you're not willing to invest the time, don't ask the question. But if you're looking for an open door, that means you're willing to walk through that door. And guess what? You might have to be there a while. Guess what? Philip was with this guy for a while. It's worth it. Again, you might miss one of your appointments. So that you can make one of God's. And that's okay. Now the third thing is this. Let the word work. Let the word do the work. That's what it's for. You, you don't have to talk anybody into anything. Let the word do the work. This is what the Bible says in verse 34 and 35. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me, 
Was the prophet talking about himself or someone else? Now, Philip could have said, well, personally, I, you know. Philip might have had his, his own thoughts on the matter, but look at what he does. So beginning with the same scripture, which that was a quote that he was reading from out of the book of Isaiah, Philip said, well, let's just start with the passage of scripture that you were reading. Let's, let's start with the word. It says, beginning with the same scripture, Philip told him the good news about Jesus. Did you get that? Philip let the word do the work. That, that, now, th you're talking about someone who was an apostle of Jesus Christ. You're talking about someone who, who could have just gone straight in with, let me tell you what's been happening the last three years. Right? But instead, he recognized that the door was open and there was the word. And so he said, let's just start right here. We, we don't have a record of that entire conversation, but boy, wouldn't that have been a good one. Wouldn't that have been, I would have loved to have heard Philip take the eunuch from Isaiah and this passage into Jesus in the presentation of accepting the gospel. How, how, how powerful. Christian, know this. God gave his word for this purpose. God has given us his word because his word is alive and active. The Bible says it's sharper than any two-edged sword. The Bible says that it's able to penetrate between the bone and the marrow. You can't do that. God's word can God, God says that, that his word is, is able to bring conviction to someone concerning their need for salvation. I cannot do that. I, I mean, I can't work that way. But the word can. Stop putting the burden on your shoulders concerning this part. Your responsibility is to listen and to look, the word's responsibility is to convict. The word's responsibility is to draw between the word of God and the Holy Spirit of God. That's how it happens. In the testimony that Mike shared, he mentioned one verse, Romans 5.8. God has demonstrated his love towards us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And you see what? Even as a teenager, the word, one verse, the word did the work. Did you get that? How, how many times did your mama preach to you, right? How, how, how many times did other people tell you all kinds of things, right? About you need to straighten up. You need to get it right. You need to quit doing this and doing that, right? You need to grow up, right? How many times? And then what happens? One verse verse does the work. Philip knew that. He knew the word could do the work. You need to know that as well. Have confidence, even if it's just that one verse. Romans 5, 8, memorize it. And then let the word do the work. John 3, 16, let the word do the work. Romans 10, 9, and 10, let the word do the work. That's what it's there for. I love in, in Billy Graham's messages, when you go back and, and, and listen to those, replay those messages, they should still be playing those on every radio station. Like once a day, they should be playing one of his messages. I'm talking about those messages, first of all, super simple. I mean, it reminds me of when I read Jesus' preaching and teaching. Not complicated. He wasn't trying to see how educated he could sound. Billy Graham knew how to preach. He, he, he was anointed by God to preach the good news. Anointed by God to expound the scriptures. Anointed. Knew, knew more than a dozen preachers put together. No doubt about it. But what did he do? He let the word do the work. You'll find, you listen to his messages. Here's what he says. He'll say a word or two, a sentence or two, and then he'll say, the Bible says, and then he'll tell what the Bible says. And then he'll make another point, and he'll, he'll, he'll talk about that a little bit, and then it won't be long. He'll say, the Bible says, 
And he'll, he doesn't even reference it. He doesn't even give you the address. He just says, the Bible says, and then he goes on and, and lets the word do the work. That's what you need to do. That's what I need to do. And the fourth is this. Lead with the gospel. Lead with the gospel. What I mean is this. If you've gotten to a point in a conversation where you could close it down, where you could turn it into an invitation to church, where you could turn it into a, well, I'll be praying for you, don't do that. Lead with the gospel. That's exactly what Philip does here in 36 and 37. As they rode along, they came to some water. The eunuch said, look, there's some water. Why can't I be baptized? Because evidently their conversation had, had gotten pretty much all the way through. Philip had probably told the, the Ethiopian treasurer about Jesus getting baptized. And, and Philip probably then told him about the time that he got baptized, right? And so he says, well, there's some water. I, I, I want to be baptized, right? And Philip said, you can if you believe with all your heart. If you believe the gospel, there it is. You've got you to believe in this good news. You've got to believe in what I've told you. And then obviously he has shared the good news because he says, and the eunuch replied, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Right? You, you need to lead with the gospel. Again, as I mentioned it earlier, it's easy to turn it into a conversation that's going to result just in, in me maybe offering a word of encouragement or, or in me telling you that I'm going to pray or in me hoping that you'll come to my church. That, that's the easier of the paths, and I'm not telling you not to do that. I do it too. I'm, I, I do it all the time. But I'm saying sometimes you need to have a different approach because sometimes the door was opened for a reason. Sometimes the conversation has led to this point where the only thing that God wants is for you to make sure that person hears the gospel. Lead with it. It's the best news you got. It's the best news you can share. Lead with it. What happens when these things are done? Well, a lot of times, the same thing that happened on this day. Somebody's life got changed. Somebody walked away with a testimony. So, somebody got cleansed, right? So, somebody, somebody was forgiven. Somebody's got new life. Right? Somebody's been born again. That happens. Are you listening? Are you looking? Are you letting and are you leading? And if the answer is, well, I don't, I don't think I have been. Because here's how you know if you have been. Ready? Ready? You've got some stories to tell about the times that he said, go down the road. You went down the road. He said, go over to the carriage. You went over to the car carriage. It, you, you've, you'll have stories of the times that, that you let the word do the work and and. And where you, you led with the gospel and someone's life was changed. That's how, that's how you know if you've been doing these things. Now, if, 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 if you don't have some stories to tell about these things happening in your life, that's okay. Own up to it. See, that's the thing. What, what do I do in response to the challenge of God's word? Own up to it. Don't, don't try and turn away from it. Don't try and ignore it. Don't try and, try and act like, well, you know, maybe it's just different for me. No, 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 no. That's God, God wants to work in the same ways in your life, just like he did in Philip's, just like he did in Paul's. You can, you, these same four things are evident throughout the Acts of the Apostles. These same four things are evident throughout the ministry of Jesus Christ. Somebody's listening. Somebody's looking. And somebody's letting the word do the, do the work. And then somebody's leading with truth, right? Somebody's leading with the gospel. You'll see this over and over in Scripture. This isn't just a, a one-time only example. This is the pattern that needs to be occurring in our lives as well. This, this is a pattern that needs to occur in your life. And so you respond to it. You say, okay. 
I, I want this pattern to show up in my life. I want you to stand with me. And this is your opportunity. We're just going to pray together. And I, I want you to be honest first with yourself and then with the Lord. Lord, I recognize that I need to listen more. I need to, I need to listen to those promptings. I, I, need, I need to listen to your instructions. I, I need to be more mindful, more sensitive of which direction you want me to go. I, I need to be careful and not scheduling myself to the point where I can't make one of your appointments because I'm always trying to make one of my own. I want to listen. And Lord, I recognize that I need to be more aware. I, my eyes need to be open spiritually to the doors. I want to walk through them. And Lord, I recognize that it was your word that did the work in my life. I want to let your word do the work in others. So Lord, give me that one verse. Give, give me that one piece of scripture that I can share. And Lord, that I might lead with the gospel. Lord, that I might never walk away from a conversation having not made sure that they knew that it was just Jesus. Lord, I thank you for this precious time that we've had. This has been wonderful today, Father. It's always so good. And it's been good again. might we take with us and share with others the best news we've ever heard or received. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Before we dismiss, I just need to make a couple of quick announcements because we're running a little bit behind, but it's not Mike's fault, it's mine. I don't want you to feel guilty. I, I promise you, you could have you could have shared much longer. Um, we've got a embrace grace baby shower, and that information is in the bulletin. But Heather is right here. Heather, I think a lot of people are going to come out this way. I want you to stand right here, and we've got uh, we're sponsoring a young lady, um, and we're we're buying the the gifts for the baby shower for her. Okay, and so. Several of us need to participate in this, and Heather's got a list, and there's also information in the bulletin. But Heather, come on over here and stand right here because I want some of these ladies to be able to, to see you when they leave. And guys, you can buy diapers and wipes and such too. And then I also need to remind you that if you are helping with the uh, missions golf tournament next Sunday, or if you want to help with that golf tournament next Sunday, you need to go to the conference room on Wednesday at 6.30 to meet and go over the details with Tim and Linda DeLore. So even if you hadn't signed up, but you want to help, you need to do that. Finally is this. Next Sunday, do we have church here at this location? No. Everybody say no. 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 Where are we going to have it at? If you don't know where that is, that's on the campus of Wilkes Community College, okay? You just drive till you see us. We'll be in the back. <laughs> Make sure that you bring a, a picnic basket. Bring a friend, bring a family member. That's, but we will have no services here next Sunday. It will be a one ten o'clock worship service at the Watson stage, okay? And then we'll have a big fellowship meal afterwards at the Watson stage. Does that sound good? Joseph, come up and lead us in the blessing so we can get people to Sunday school. Everybody find somebody. Put them hands up. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you. 
and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace.